In the title sequence of Platoon, the actor names of Tom Berenger and Willem Dafoe are the very first to appear. Charlie Sheen is the central character of the film and the only one who provides voiceover narration, and yet his name appears third. At the time Platoon was made, neither Berenger or Dafoe were Hollywood stars, no more than Charlie Sheen was, so it's not a case of billing the highest paid or most well-known actor first. But to me there's a simple logic at work here. The characters of Barnes and Elias hold as much weight in this film as Taylor does. The movie centres around their personal conflict and how that conflict in turn affects Taylor. And perhaps Berenger's name appearing before Defoe's is because Taylor initially admires and respects Barnes, who Berenger plays, respects him as a role model, but gradually shifts ideologically toward Elias. I remember when you first came in here. Telling me how much you admired the bastard. I was wrong. In our very first view of Elias, he carries a machine gun across his shoulders and looks pretty tired. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this is likely a crucifixion metaphor. As will become more evident throughout his scenes, Elias serves as a Jesus Christ figure in this story. In fact, actor Willem Dafoe went on to play Jesus in Martin Scorsese's movie, The Last Temptation. I wonder if Scorsese spotted the Jesus framing of Sergeant Elias and casted him with that in mind just a couple of years later. By interesting comparison, Jim Caviezel played a Jesus-like spiritual soldier in the war movie The Thin Red Lion, and about six years later he went on to play Jesus in Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. Continuing with the chronological breakdown of Elias' scenes, after Barnes shows zero sympathy for Taylor's inexperience and weakness, Elias steps in and relieves Taylor of some of his burdens. You're humping too much stuff, Troop. I'll haul it for you. But next time you check with me first, all right? Okay. And he even said it with a warm smile. And by saying check with me first, he has offered himself up as a willing mentor. His casual willingness to carry the extra load conveys his physical strength, too. In his next scene, the conflict of mentoring styles between Elias and Barnes is established. Regarding the raw recruits, Barnes takes a throw-them-in-at-the-deep-end, swim-or-drown approach. Tough love. While Elias takes a more nurturing, gradual approach. They don't know shit, Barnes, and chances are we're gonna run into something. Think about it. Barnes doesn't even argue with him, just reaffirms the order, so it seems this kind of conflict between these two characters isn't something new. The same goes for Elias' arguments with O'Neill here. That's just great, Bob. And what do you want me to do? Send one of my guys out to get zapped so some lame-ass just in from the world can get his beauty sleep? Hey, O'Neill, take a break. You don't have to be a prick every day of your life, you know. Elias, get your men ready. Short and sweet and lacking in intellectual articulation, his insults suggest that they've had this kind of argument before. And O'Neill's follow-up comment is one of the film's most direct references to Elias being a Jesus figure. This guy's in three years, he thinks he's Jesus fucking Christ or something. O'Neill... Your short time or stay in. The nighttime ambush scene that follows I've already explored in my Rebirth Under Fire video, but it's worth noting that when Elias tells the new recruits which bits of gear to leave behind, he tells Gardner to tuck in his peace symbol. Some commented on my video about this scene that, that Elias did this purely so that the peace symbol wouldn't jangle and be heard by the enemy, but I don't buy that. It looks like it's made of wood, and the notion of hiding the peace symbol fits very well with the duality of Elias' role in this war. He's a compassionate and peaceful man, but by necessity he puts his peace symbol ideology aside when engaging in combat. Next up we enter what Ramucci calls the Underworld, spiritual reference, and Taylor joins his first stoner session here. Lead character Chris here is cross-referenced with Christ by being referred to as resurrected. What you doing in the underworld, Taylor? Well, this here ain't Taylor. Taylor been shot. This man here is Chris. He been resurrected. Chris Taylor, Chris T, Christ. And immediately after this resurrection and Christ reference is made, Taylor turns to see Elias chilling on a hammock surrounded by candles. Another spiritual image. Note also the use of Christmas lights in parts of this set. Christmas is when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, or we're supposed to anyway. And while the lead character's name here suggests him to be the Christ figure, most of the evidence in the film points to Elias being the Christ figure. Elias essentially represents part of Taylor's internal ideological struggle anyway, so maybe there isn't much difference. 
A big prophetic looking picture of North Vietnamese leader Ho Chi Minh is above Elias in his own chill out space. Thanks to my Facebook followers for pointing that out to me, I didn't know who the hell this guy was. Why have a prominent picture of the enemy where he sleeps? Does he sympathise with the North Vietnamese leader and his communist cause? Weird thing is, communism is generally anti-religious, but in Vietnam's unique take on communism, Ho Chi Minh is considered by some as a holy figure. I've said it before and I'll say it again, ideological labels are garbage because the reality pretty much always contradicts the labels. Maybe Elias is simply interested in understanding the enemy rather than the Barnes philosophy of just killing them. Maybe he sees some merit in communism or some merit in Ho Chi Minh himself. By the way, something funny here is that with one arm up and eating a banana, Elias looks like a monkey chilling in a tree. After he dies much later, Ramucci states that very comparison. And if there's a heaven, and God, I hope there is. I know he's sitting up there drunk as a fucking monkey and smoking shit. Back to the scene we were talking about. We have Elias giving Taylor a mind-expanding smoke through his gun barrel. A nice mix of military and hippie metaphors. Elias is both. So it's like he is the key figure who spiritually awakens Taylor. In his next scene, Elias heads alone into an enemy tunnel complex, the spiritual soldier heading bravely into the depths of the earth to face evil alone. I don't know if it was standard for tunnel rat US soldiers to go it alone like this underground. Seems like a bit of backup would be helpful or whether a higher ranking officer like him would be sent on such a mission in the first place. But anyway, here he finds a spiritual underground quite different to the one that the stoners hang out in. This one is mostly silent and has a dead body in it. As he goes on this little journey, Taylor sees a snake slither past between his feet. The presence of snakes was already established in the opening jungle scene as a danger symbol, so I wonder if its repetition here is symbolic again, like evil is present and slithering about in tunnels beneath the platoon's feet. Stealth was an essential asset of VC and MVA tactics from what I've read. Elias now shoots one enemy soldier with very calm single bullet precision. Then a couple of American soldiers are killed by a booby trap. And the musical aftermath here sounds spiritual, like some ancient tribal ritual has just occurred. In his next scene, Elias interrupts Barnes on a killing rampage in the village. Elias is the only soldier in the platoon who has the guts to challenge Barnes, and he does it without hesitation the moment he steps into the village. Barnes' response here does show hesitation, like he knows he's upset the wrong guy. Stay out, it's Elias. This ain't your show. And again, this is something I quite like about Elias. I mean, he's a spiritual, hippie-type character, and sometimes in real life... Those kinds of people are just not the fighting types. You put them up against somebody in a fist fight and they just back away and cry. But Elias has got that philosophy, but he's also got the strengths of the soldier. Hitting Barnes in the face with his rifle, he could have broke his jaw or cracked his skull even. Attacking him in itself is guaranteed to turn Barnes into an enemy. And with so many witnesses, Elias could have even got court-martialed himself for this. I think Elias could have easily talked Barnes into standing down here. The mere threat of court-martial for murder probably would have been enough. And Ramucci successfully uses that tactic later. Ten years ago, I enlisted, man. Ten years. Climb the fucking walls, man. Don't do it. But with these two characters, the ideological fight between them is going to gradually reveal itself to be a fight between good and evil anyway, so the full-on physical declaration of war from both of them here, it works much better dramatically. By the way, in the middle of the fight here, one of the other soldiers shouts, Send him to hell. I don't know if they were shouting that to Elias or to Barnes, but it's another reference to the spiritual battle between these characters. That spiritual and ideological battle extends out to the other soldiers, forcing them to pick sides for most of the rest of the movie. Barnes inspires some of them to want to slaughter the whole village, and it can be argued that Elias inspires Taylor to stop the gang rape of village girls. 
Emphasising Elias's inspiration on Taylor here, Elias steps in to support his actions. Get out of there! It's notable that before Elias challenged Barnes, Taylor clearly wanted to intervene, but lacked the courage. Now, if Elias wanted to go all out in his court-martial report, he could have also included this rape and had Taylor as a witness against these men. But he clearly views Barnes as the central problem. Eliminate his leadership and these men will behave. That seems to be the general idea of Elias' thinking. In turn, Barnes now calls Elias a water walker. He's a troublemaker. He Elias is a water walker. That's another biblical reference. Didn't Jesus walk on water? And in his next scene, Elias is staring up at the stars, the heavens, and having a one-to-one -one chat with Taylor. Given that each of them have just intervened in war crimes, it seems like they're developing quite a bond with a spiritual element. In the next battle scene, Elias shows off his war skills, which are arguably on par with Sergeant Barnes. He may even be the greatest soldier. With sleeveless, lean arms on display, a headband and no protective helmet, He's like a Rambo Jesus figure taking the fight to the enemy, doing the good lord's work. Like with the tunnel scene, he charges into enemy territory alone. Hey, can I go with you? No. We move faster alone. Even smiling before charging off into that battle, unafraid of what could be his own death. And this battle sequence he has is spiritual in tone, the tribalistic and ominous music, The moments of stillness and fog, and a war cry that sends the enemies running back where they came from. <coughs> but then comes the stealthy evil of Barnes, the evil he underestimated. Their approach of each other has a mystical vibe to it as well. Good and evil about to face off. Elias smiles at him, which is perhaps even an, an open defiance of Barnes' hope that Elias would die in this battle. Or maybe it's even a genuinely friendly smile, one soldier to another, and previous clashes all forgotten. Either way, Barnes is to Elias what the backstabbing Judas was to Jesus. Having been shot three times in the torso, somehow Elias is not only still alive, but is able to run for his life. Shot even more times, he still carries on moving almost superhuman, but an even bigger spiritual indicator here is that Elias dies among church ruins. Now get your wounded man and get the fuck back to church. Get going. His last moment shows him with arms spread out like he's being crucified, which also became one of the central marketing posters of the film. And remember his very first appearance had him carrying a gun over his shoulders like Christ nailed to a cross? Well, here he is in his final moment with that same metaphor again. As he falls, Chopper whizzes past like his soul has just departed. After his death, final mentions of the Elias character involve references to the spirit realm. And if there's a heaven, and God I hope there is, I know he's sitting up there drunk as a fucking monkey and smoking shit. Elias was a crusader. Crusader, that word comes from the Crusades, a biblical conflict reference. So that's all of his scenes out the way, and it seems quite evident that Elias doubles up as a Jesus Christ figure. Interesting being that writer-director Oliver Stone here, he doesn't usually make religious-themed films. Hardly ever, as far as I can tell. There seems to be an absence of religious beliefs expressed in the interviews he's done too, so why would he make Elias a Jesus figure in this story? A Jesus figure who swears and gets stoned, and even engages in armed conflict. Well, I think part of it might be the notion of Oliver Stone feeling uh, emotionally crucified himself by his Vietnam War experiences, and this is part of how Platoon expresses it. The communist ideology of the North Vietnamese could be a factor here too. Communists tend to be anti-religious because they view it as a psychological control mechanism, but they contradict themselves by worshipping all controlling government bureaucracy as the equivalent of God, which is just as bad. Communist Vietnam had engaged in its share of religious suppression too, so maybe attacking Elias, a Jesus figure in the ruins of a church, represents their war on spirituality. 
In fact, the MVA here seemed to sacrifice an awful lot of men just to chase Elias, who is only one enemy soldier and is already wounded and likely to be out of action anyway. But the interpretation which I find the most plausible here is that Elias isn't just the ideological and philosophical opposite of Sergeant Barnes, he is his spiritual opposite. Two characters who personify good versus evil in lead character Taylor's psyche. So there you go, Sergeant Elias is a marvellous character, unofficially a holy man in soldier's uniform. But it's easy to miss out on this symbolic side of Elias because his dialogue is scripted to sound very natural. No long moralistic speeches, no walking around in white robes, no holding his hands out in spiritual gestures with shining light behind him. He just talks like a grunt, not a shaman or a scholar. And that's great because some of the most noble people in life are like that. They're sophisticated and wise on the inside, they just don't articulate it outside. And Willem Dafoe delivers such a naturalistic, career-highlight performance that Elias comes off like a street-smart or jungle-smart everyday guy. But also, Elias's capacity and willingness to use violence especially masks over his uh, spiritual side, so it seems that, like Taylor and the rest of us, he too is torn between the light and the dark. Hope you enjoyed this, you've been listening to Rob Ager. Take it easy folks, bye bye.